Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to uh, the videos. Uh, we haven't had one in a while. Hope everyone's doing well. Uh, I know uh, you. By the time you watch this, you'll have taken the AP exam. Uh, hope that went well. Hope that went smoothly, and there were no uh, technology issues or anything like that. Um, I know it's not the way you thought you'd be taking the AP exam, but you know you played the hand you're dealt, and that's what we're doing right now. So. Uh, so yeah, but anyway, I hope you I hope you guys did well. I, I, I have full full confidence in all of you, so I hope, hope that went well. Uh, I'll send out a reminder about this. Probably already have uh, by the time you watched it, but um, uh, we've got three final topics to go over um, for the year. Uh, we're going to take abnormal psychology, uh, which we're starting right now, and we're going to split it into one section that has the disorders, the illnesses. Uh, as one content topic and then um uh uh then we'll have a uh, a second one um for therapies and treatment and then our final uh topic will be uh social psychology and then those those are the final three things and then once we get those three uh that that's it uh for uh in terms of content and we'll communicate how we're going to wrap up the year and and all that good good stuff so anyway um so let's just go ahead and jump right into abnormal psychology for for something to be considered abnormal behavior. It kind of has to meet these four qualifications. Uh, uh, just because you have an abnormal behavior pattern doesn't necessarily mean that there's a mental illness attached to it. However, there's a good chance. Um, very rarely does abnormal behavior that that meets these four uh, uh kind of characteristics uh very rarely does it not have a mental component attached to it as well so um but sometimes by the way sometimes you'll see this referred to as the four d's uh deviant dysfunctional dangerous and distressful uh so um but sometimes it's also just referred to uh, as unusual maladaptive disturbing distress. so sometimes it's four d's sometimes it's not uh the four d's is just kind of help you to remember it a little bit easier but um uh so but anyway uh for for something to be considered abnormal behavior it has to be unusual or deviant it has to be uh infrequent in a given population so um if someone's acting differently than pretty much everybody else in the population then that's considered abnormal it has to be maladaptive it has to be dysfunctional um so uh in other words it has to be um it has to be something that interferes with someone's ability to live their life normally, um, which uh, is, you know, a lot could be a lot of things. But basically, you, someone can't function normally with because of this, because of the, the, the behavior, the thoughts or, you know, thinking patterns that they're having. Um, and we'll get more into this in a little bit. But mental illness is not something that, you know, um, someone wants. This isn't something that someone uh you know is, is, you know their, their life is not easier because of it so um that it has to be dysfunctional in that case uh in some cases it can be or it has to be disturbing and in some cases it can be dangerous um it's a serious departure from kind of the social or cultural ways or norms if you will uh and i in some cases it can be dangerous to others or to the individual um, there are some, we're not going to talk about a lot of them today, but there are some uh, psychological disorders or mental illnesses that have a, that cause the, the person to have a break with reality. And when someone has a break with reality, they are not aware of what they're doing or what, what's happening. And in some cases that can be dangerous um, to the, to the individual or to the people around them. And then finally, it has to be distressful. It has to prevent someone from, uh, from thinking about or, or from thinking clearly and making rational decisions um a lot of these mental illnesses change thought patterns and change what is considered normal thinking and it causes an individual to not make sound decisions um and that's so any it, it pretty much has to meet all four of these things for it to be considered you know an abnormal behavior pattern and you like I said, usually if these four things are met, if these four check boxes are checked, then there's usually a mental illness component to it as well. 
Um, okay, so in order to figure out if someone actually has a mental issue or a mental disorder, um, they have to meet the quali- uh, the characteristics and the the criteria for those mental disorders, and those are found in this document, uh, this book that's published by the American Psychological Association. Uh, called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And that's a mouthful. So it's almost always referred to as the DSM. Um, and then the number attached to it is the edition. So the current DSM edition is the DSM-5. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, that came out uh, about, I think, 2017. But don't quote me on that. Um, but uh, it um, these, these uh, manuals are divided into categories and each of the categories are divided into specific illnesses and disorders and the criteria symptoms uh behavior patterns characteristics all that stuff is 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 uh listed out under each mental disorder and it's used to diagnose this is the main thing you need to know about the dsm is that it is used strictly to diagnose to help someone figure out what an individual is suffering from. Um, the one, the, the, something you will not find in the DSM, you will not find therapies, you will not find treatment patterns or suggestions, you will not find medication suggestions. That is entirely up to the individuals who are charged with treating someone suffering from a mental disorder. This is simply to help classify and diagnose. Um, it, uh, it is not used at all in any way in regards to therapy, which, like I said, is going to, we're going to talk about next week. Um, but a couple of things about the DSM. You, if you look at the the, the ones there on the, in that photograph, um, you can see each one gets a little bit larger than the previous one. And I and usually students will ask, well, why is that? Does that are there more mental disorders being discovered? And yeah, sometimes some show up, but that's the much more common thing that's happening is those mental disorders are being more and more broken down into sub like subgroups and more specific types of a disorder. Um, so and each one has to have its own classification and criteria and symptoms and all that. So it, that's why each addition keeps getting larger and larger. Um It's not necessarily that more and more mental disorders are being discovered. Um, It's more that they're they're, they're getting more and more specific about the classifications of those disorders. Um, Another quick side note about the DSM, um, it changes just because something's in one edition doesn't mean that it will be in the next. Uh, For example, um, in the early editions of the DSM, uh, homosexuality was considered a mental illness. Um, it is no longer uh, considered a mental illness that has been taken out of the DSM. Um, and one of the more uh, controversial in- inclusions in the most recent DSM um, centers around gender identity and children, um, gender identity disorder or childhood uh, gender dysphoria, um, because there's a lot of debate about whether uh, a-, a child that's of you know of a certain age and hasn't reached maturity yet can actually distinguish between you know an identity issue with their gender again i'm not smart enough to know that debate uh or anything but it it that is probably the more controversial thing in the most recent one is an inclusion of you know a disorder with childhood gender identity um so i mean there, there and that can always change i mean there's a lot of things that have come and gone um but just know that it, it keeps getting larger because of the classifications and spe- specificity surrounding each mental disorder and not because there's more and more stuff showing up. All right. Um, I, I'm not going to go over this super specific. This is just a chart that shows you what each perspective may say about the cause of a disorder. Um, so you can see there, like, obviously, like this, the first one, they're psychoanalytic, psychodynamic, that's Freudian. So, of course, they're going to say that the internal unconscious subconscious drives are what is um, the driving force behind mental illness. Cognitive, it's our thinking pattern. So, of course, it's going to say that we're having irrational thinking 
dysfunctional thinking. That's what's causing uh, the behavior and the thoughts to, to do that. So you can go through each of the, I mean, this just shows you like what each perspective may say about uh, the abnormal psychology, or excuse me, the abnormal behavior and where it comes from. Okay, so we're gonna go over two uh, classifications of disorders uh, in this video. And then with the next two videos, we'll go into a couple of different, uh, a couple more disorder classifications. So we're going to start with anxiety and dissociative. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, these are uh, just a few of the most common anxiety disorders. That does not mean that these, these are not by no means are these the only ones. There are so many more that we don't have time to get into, but these are the ones that uh, the AP people say are the most important to go over. So uh, anxiety disorders are um, a, uh, any type of disorder that causes extreme levels of fear or anxiety, which basically impacts someone's thinking and their behavior. Um, anxiety is a normal thing okay i mean we all are anxious at some point in our lives um we all get nervous we all get stressed anxiety is normal however um anxiety that could be considered a psychological issue is when there is in no rational reason as to why you're anxious so it's an irrational anxiety um it's an uncontrollable anxiety no matter what you do you cannot control it and it's disruptive. It, it impacts your relationships. It impacts your life. It impacts your career, your your uh, your your relationships, everything. Um, that's when it's an issue. I mean, again, normal anxiety is or, or anxiety is a normal human uh, response to things. But when anxiety gets to the point of the things we're going to talk about here, it can be an issue. So. The most common type of anxiety disorder is what's called generalized anxiety disorder. And this is not anxiety from any specific thing. It's very difficult to treat because we don't know. It's it's usually very unclear where the anxiety comes from. It's just all we all the person knows is that it's constant. It's uncontrollable. It's ongoing. It's always there. And it goes into a wide range of things in their life. Um, sometimes this is called free floating anxiety. In other words, the anxiety just floats to various things um, in uh, in your life. Um, and um, for some reason, this seems to treat or excuse me, this seems to affect women more than men. Um, it's twice as many women seem to suffer from this. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean one thing to keep in mind. And I always have to, to point this out that doesn't mean that there's 100 like there's always twice as many women uh, you know uh affected by this as men there is a there is a, a train of thought from a lot of people that part of the reason why a lot of mental disorders seem to affect women more than men is that women are more likely to seek help for this men seem to seem to be more likely to not seek out help for mental issues and therefore they never are diagnosed so they can't be given to the statistics so just keep that in mind um a lot of times if you look up you know populations that are that are uh that are uh, affected by these disorders any disorder it almost always seems to affect women more than men and that's kind of a little bit of a little bit of a false uh statistic because men and i i say this being a man um, we are stubborn and stupid at times and we won't seek out help. So, um, and you know, that's, that's just a general thing that not, and again, not all men, but you know, a lot, a lot of the population. So anyway, for generalized, just make sure to remember that, um, it, it is, it's very difficult to treat because we don't know where it's exactly coming from, but usually this is, this is basically just treated, uh, through medication and counseling as are a lot of mental disorders. But um, but yeah, uh, it's it's a persistent, ongoing, uh, uncontrollable anxiety, and we don't know why. Um, panic disorder is kind of the same thing as generalized anxiety disorder. <coughs> excuse me, except that there are panic attacks uh, associated with it. And if you've ever had a panic attack, you know that it is um, incredibly uh, uh, stressful and scary to have. 
and someone who has panic disorder um, basically has panic attacks, uncontrollable panic attacks because of the anxiety that they are experiencing um, from the disorder. So if you look at the, you know, the, the image here, you know, the anxiety of the possibility of having a panic attack is what makes the, 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 anxi the, the, the whole situation worse. You have a panic attack, you get fearful of another one. So you have more anxiety, which means you have another attack, which be more fear, more anxiety. And you can see it's a vicious, vicious cycle. Um, so, pa again, panic disorder, uh, usually accompanied by uncontrollable panic attacks, um, which, of course, leads to those things there. You see pounding heart, rapid breathing, sudden dizziness, lightheadedness. And in some cases, you pass out from a panic attack. So. Um, so a panic disorder is classified as an anxiety disorder because it's a, it's the anxiety that causes the panic attacks to begin with. All right. Phobic disorders or a phobia. Now, look, again, it is completely normal to be afraid of things. Um, you know, I uh, you know, I am not a huge fan of uh, of heights. I know that's kind of ironic being tall, but um, I mean, but at the same time, I don't have a phobia of heights like I'm uncomfortable at times with heights but that but that doesn't mean that i you know live my life around avoiding heights which someone with a phobic disorder they have an ear in some case now in some cases it can be rational but most of the time it's an irrational fear of an object or a situation that normally don't cause those fears um uh, I have a, you know, I have a family member who is um, agoraphobic, which is why that example is there. Um, agoraphobia is when you have an irrational fear of being in public because something might happen and you might not be able to get help. Now, I know that sounds kind of weird uh, and, and, and maybe a little, you know, for lack of a better term, a little stupid, but um for someone with a phobia of or with agoraphobia, it's not because they, they literally their life cannot operate normally if they were to put themselves into public arenas and public places because of the fear that it would cause um, someone with, you know, arachnophobia, fear of spiders. Again, totally normal to be afraid of spiders. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of them anyway, but if you had arachnophobia, you would literally of your, your life would be dictated by avoiding spiders at all costs or the possibility of spiders at all costs. Um, again, being afraid of something and having a phobic disorder are two completely different things. Being afraid is completely normal. You, it's, it's OK to be afraid of things and, and normal in some cases to be afraid. But a phobic disorder means your entire life would be upended and 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 disrupted because of the possibility of that object or situation presenting itself. Um, so whereas if you have arachnophobia, just this is just an example, like if you have an arachnophobia, you may not go into the room at the zoo, or excuse me, if you're, let me back up, if you're afraid of spiders, you may not go into the room of spiders at the zoo. If you have arachnophobia, you may not go outside because there might be spiders outside. You see the difference, like it's totally, totally different. But phobic disorders are considered anxiety because it causes that fear and anxiety to, to show up. Uh, by the way, if you Google, you know, phobias, there is, uh, you know, hundreds of phobias out there. Some of them are completely, you know, completely out of left field. Um, you know, uh, the uh, one, I don't remember the exact term, but I was looking through it one time and there's one for the fear of peanut butter sticking to the top of your mouth. So there you go. All right. So anyway, moving on. Um, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Again, this is one that gets a little bit of a misrepresentation in, in society as a whole. Um, I know I'm guilty of saying things like, oh, I'm OCD about that, which is probably a little insulting to someone who actually does have OCD. Um, and I've had students in the past who have OCD. Um, so I try not, I try to be respectful of that. But um just because you have preferences, like I, I have some weird preferences in my life. Like I back when DVDs were a thing instead of streaming everything, like I always had to have all of my DVDs in alphabetical order. I don't know why I, it just made me feel better if they were. If I'm lucky enough to actually have cash in my wallet, which doesn't happen very often. But if I do, 
I always like to have the bills facing the same way to where when I open my wallet, I see the face of the bill. And I always like them to go from left to right in terms of smallest to largest. So in my wallet, it would be from one to five because I usually don't have anything higher than a $5 bill because I'm a teacher. Um, but, you know, if I had multiple ones, it would go from the smallest to large. That's just a preference that I do not have obsessive compulsive disorder about the bills in my wallet or my DVDs being in order. Um, that's just preferences. Obsessive, someone who has obsessive compulsive disorder, they have obsessive thoughts that do not go away that force them to compulsively act in some way. Um, uh, and the, the, oh, that's because that's the only way they can reduce the anxiety is to compulsively act on the, that obsessive thought that they're having. Um, for example, you know, uh, probably the most recognizable if you if you watch this show or, or any of the, uh, on if you watch America's Got Talent, uh, Howie Mandel, one of the judges, the guy with the shaved head, uh, he had he is uh, he has a very serious diagnosis of obsessive of obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and you can probably Google, you know, Howie Mandel OCD and, and read all about this. But he uh, if you ever notice when he sh when he meets people, he will not shake hands. Um, uh, he always fist bumps uh, because he will not because in his mind, he believes that germs live like germs are probably going to live most in my hand. Like most of the germs are going to live right here in the palm of the hand because uh, it's kind of it gets sweaty and things like that. So and, and because of those obsessive thoughts he has about germs, he won't do that because if he were to shake someone's hand, it would cause him to go down a spiral of unwanted thoughts. Um, you know, someone, someone else who has uh, a, like a germ, like a germ uh, OCD thing would probably wash their hands constantly throughout the day, like more so than the normal person would or should, because anytime they're not washing their hands, they're having the obsessive thought of, oh my gosh, you've got germs on your hands. So the obsessive part is the thought, which, com which causes the compulsive behavior of washing hands, whatever. Um, and it's, it's very significant and distressful because the person can't, they can't live their life normally. You know, they can't, um, they can't do things that, that, that normal people would be able to do because of, um, because of the fact that they're having these obsessive thoughts. Um, and, and, and without the, the, the thoughts never go away. And because of that, their behavior always is, is compulsive and out of the ordinary. Um, another very common, uh, anxiety disorder is PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. This is usually in, in populations that have, uh, that have experienced significant traumatic events. Um, so you see this a lot in veterans, you see this a lot in, um, people who have been abused. Um, but it's, you know, it's usually you, you basically are exposed to a traumatic event, uh, whether it's physical or emotional trauma. And then um, usually the, the, the symptoms are involuntary distressful memories, which sometimes lead to things like depression, uh, self-harm sometimes. Um, inability to concentrate, and in some cases, uh, PTSD uh, leads to suicidal thoughts, and, and in some cases, someone people commit suicide because of PTSD because the thoughts just don't go away. Um, there has been a lot of advancement in this in the area of this this disorder over the years, but it is still a very significant one, um, and it's one that affects a lot of different people. Um, not, I mean, a lot of people think veterans, I mean, it, yes, a lot of veterans do suffer from PTSD, but they are by far not the only population to deal with it. Um, so, uh, so that, those are the anxiety disorders. Now the dissociative disorders, these are controversial because they involve kind of a splitting of awareness or memory or consciousness or identity. Um, basically someone with a dissociative disorder is going to have issues with how they view themselves, or in some cases, they may feel like they have multiple identities or personalities. Um, and uh, we don't know why these occur a lot of times, but they are, um, they're interesting to look at, but um, uh, 
but it's uh, it, it, we don't really know why they occur and, and it's difficult to treat at times too. So this is the one that you've probably heard of, but it's you've probably heard something called multiple personality disorder. That's what it used to be called. It was changed in the DSM a couple uh, a couple of uh, revisions back to di dissociative identity disorder. Um, and this is when someone seems to have the presence of two or more very distinct personalities within the same individual. Um, and each personality might have its own name, its own identity, its own memories. Um, it's a pretty controversial diagnosis. A lot of people feel like it's a, uh, a lot of people feel like it may be a, uh, an act. Um, but, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it, it, it's controversial. Um, the people who have been diagnosed with this, uh, a lot of times, um, uh, th there's some controversy surrounding it. Uh, one of the more famous individuals to have been diagnosed with this is uh, Herschel Walker, who used to be a pretty famous football player. He played at Georgia, played in the NFL for a while, uh, did a bunch, did Dancing with the Stars, I think, for a while. I didn't, I've been told. Um, but he has been diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder and wrote a book about it. And a lot of people gave him criticism because they believed he was faking it um, or something like that. So anyway, um, it's you know, it's it's a pretty controversial diagnosis. Um, but it, it is when you have two or more and you, you can switch between the uh, the personality. So in, in some scenarios, uh, you may be switching back and forth between, and it's not sudden usually, but it can be when you switch from one personality to another based on the situation that you're in. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of discussion as to what exactly is happening here and whether this is really a full fledged mental disorder. Dissociative amnesia is when you have basically what the stereotypical amnesia is, but it's caused because of, um, uh, a, a trauma or something causes you to, um, you know, basically forget who you are or not understand who you are and the memories associated with you. Um, sometimes this is present because of traumatic events. Uh, a lot of psychologists think that it is the mind's way of um, kind of switching away from the trauma to get rid of the memories of it. Um, you know, so there's that. Uh, sometimes fuge, uh, you look there at the bottom, sometimes fuge or, uh, can be associated with it. And this is when you have amnesia, but then you basically start a new life with a different identity because of it. Um, they saw this happen sometimes in Vietnam war veterans where they would get back from Vietnam. They'd be, they, and, and they would have, they would literally like, uh, you know, start a new life somewhere with a new name and a new identity and not know who they were previously. Um, again, these are kind of rare, but they, they can happen. So that's dissociative amnesia. Um, I thought there was one more, but I must be thinking of the next, uh, the next PowerPoint. So uh, the next one, we'll, we'll look at some more, uh, some more classifications of mental disorders. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll go from there. Take care, guys.